So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Vanessa Alley and I am a navigator at Mastrius and I am extremely blessed to be able to navigate one of Yvonne's groups. Um, we've been meeting now for I think four months, right Yvonne? Gosh, I can't believe that I don't know that, but at least that. Yeah. And oh, hey, Deb's hopping in, so that's great. And um, yeah, it, I'm just really happy to be able to to host this. And um, hi, Deb. Hello. And to uh, introduce you all to Yvonne, anybody that doesn't know her yet, she's such a lovely, lovely person, warm, and um, such a wonderful teacher that you know her personality comes through in her paintings and in her teaching style and and i'm just so happy to um be able to do this for her today so um i'm just going to read a really quick little bio that she gave me that um can introduce you to her and um okay communicating her heart with her paintbrush yvonne passionately conveys on canvas what is bubbling up inside of her her inspiration and subject matter are vast, from a warm pastoral landscape to the deep blues and greens of an ocean scene to the exquisiteness of the human figure. Initially inspired to paint while spending time traveling in Italy, Yvonne was stirred deeply by the beauty of the old world paintings and sculptures, particularly those from the Renaissance and Baroque period. And accepting an invitation from renowned Canadian artist, David Langevin, Yvonne spent several years studying under him in the master apprentice tradition. She has been working full-time at her craft since 2007, when she was invited by, uh, sorry, invited to be represented by some of the fine art galleries in Canada. And she's disappeared. <laughs> I was going to turn the stage over to her. There you are. Hi, yes. <laughs> Hi everybody. I'm, <laughs> I've been getting messages from a couple of people wanting to join that it's asking for a passcode. So, and we don't have a passcode. So I'm just mm -hmm. resending them a link, the link. Oh, good. Okay. So you're, you're <laughs> go ahead and do that quickly. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't need a passcode. No, not at all. Yeah, the one of them asked me to, uh, the one that was in the Navigator chat asked me to, um, but I found uh, one that worked in Mastrius News. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, interesting. crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, see. So, done sorry, I'm just sending from my phone that is supposed to be on my palette. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Uh, paste. Here we go. Okay. Am I... There, is that back? Yeah, you're back to your palette. That's perfect. Okay, and anybody else that doesn't manage to get in, they can always watch the recording, so that's okay. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 So um yeah so thank you for sending that bio and I managed to um to share it with everybody and and, and if you'd like to say more a little bit more about yourself Yvonne please go ahead thanks thank you so much Vanessa and um it's it's my honor and blessing to work with both of the groups that I've been lucky enough to work with um I'm so fortunate that I was mentored. And um, as I said in a little blurb for the Meet the Mentor that Master has asked for, um, I always thought painting would be a hobby until one day David Longevin invited me to be his studio assistant. And um, I haven't ever looked back. And I pinch myself every day um, that I was that lucky to work under a modern day master. And so everything I know about painting really is from that old mass, the mentor apprentice model. And that makes me really excited about Masterius and the way that they, that this is all set up is so exciting. Um, so, and I'm passionate about being able to give back and share some of the tools and techniques that I learned and I use in my studio every day. Um, so this evening we can 
we just have an hour. I think I think it's going to go by really quickly. So we'll um, talk a little bit about my process, um, a little bit about the techniques and so on. And um, I'd like to give you a little sneak peek into how to make your paintings seem to glow from within. And um, then uh, and then I'll do a short demo to show you some of that magic. And I'd love, to, if we have a chance, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you'd like to be learning in your, as you proceed in your art um, career and your art practice. So, um, as you know, I'm sure most of you know, I use some of the techniques that the old masters used and different old masters used um, in, oh, in different ways used layering techniques and the old masters just were so amazing all of the incredible knowledge that they researched and developed and shared and passed on to each other and um unfortunately a lot of it's been lost and isn't taught very often anymore david really encouraged me once i was working full-time as a working artist to to teach and um and it's been incredibly exciting and even people who have their masters in fine arts have come to my little studio for lessons because it isn't being taught um so layering and um, many of the old masters started with that monochromatic underpainting and um and and just sort of had riffs on that different approaches to it and then would layer to add color and depth and contrast and they had figured out, they had so many reasons for using these techniques. They had figured out that, um, well, one, it's very, there's so much involved in creating a successful painting. So um, if you can focus in on tonal value and composition and design and um, create that monochromatic underpainting, then, then you, you'll be able to stand back and look at your as they called it, a grisaille, which is French for gray. Um, and you <clears throat> see if you're going, you'll pretty well know if you're going to have a successful piece and then start layering with pure pigment. They had all, also figured out that as soon as you start to mix um, more than one pigment, it begins to move toward muddy. And so you can achieve just such a glow. And I, and I, um, one of the things I want, I always, always talk to my students and people who are learning with me is that I love to share the tools and techniques and tips for you to add to your toolbox, but then you apply them the way you want to. And um, as David always says, you learn the rules so that then you can break them. And, you know, I always liken it to music. If you're learning a new instrument and you practice all the scales before, and you know, practice, practice, practice before you start composing or um, riffing on the on the music. So uh, um, it's very much like that. So I start my some of the old masters started with gray, a, a gray scale, monochromatic underpainting, so a tonal value underpainting, and some with umber. Um, I do mo lots in gray and some in umber, but most of my paintings ninety five percent do start with an underpainting and then I start layering and adding color and depth and contrast. Um, so I want to just show you, Vanessa has uh, a little slideshow to show you a little bit of a peek at the process starting with an underpainting and moving through. And of course, I can't take pictures at every stage, but so this is, um, I have the orange that you see at the top, I have glazed the whole canvas with that color and then started to work the gray scale wet into that wet glaze. So I always glaze the canvas initially and then work wet into wet. And you can see that the gray is not a dull flat gray. It's picking up the tonal values really nicely. And then I, will, then I continue on. And so I've worked the background with the grays and let little bits of that orange glow through. And you won't necessarily see orange in the end, <clears throat> depending on which painting. Sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes I 
um, I glaze over all of the orange and it looks like a different color. So here I've, so that was the finished grisaille here. I've glazed over the pastry part of this oversized dessert painting. And next, beginning to glaze over the fruit. So that is just, the red that you see is just a red, single pigment, transparent, mixed with uh, medium. And I do this with oils and or with acrylics. Oh, oh, I shouldn't say and or, or. So some of my paintings are oils, some are acrylics. I use the same techniques. And then I believe the next one is the finished piece. Gorgeous. Okay. And then we have one more series. I was commissioned to paint a dog. So it, actually, before we do that, Vanessa, okay. I'll just ask if there are any questions about that. How do you choose what color you paint uh, for your underpainting? Is it complementary color to what your main plan is or? Is that you, Karen, your? Um... Yes, it is. Yeah, your camera isn't on. Oh, and I see, hi everybody, I see more people. <laughs> Um, thanks for coming. So encouraging. Um, the how do I choose which color to start with? Is that what you asked, Karen? Yes. Yes. So um, it's a color that I want to be glowing through. I tend to start with something warm. I often start with nickel azo yellow or um, Indian yellow or sometimes quinacridone red. And um, I yeah, so I want it to glow through. Um, if I want some purple, maybe it's a sunset and I want some purples and blues, quinacridone red is a good one to start with. And it lends itself easily to that. Yeah, and um, you can, it's not like a hard and fast rule. You can certainly start with different ones and still have a successful piece. Okay, uh, so if you're, if you're painting on a really large canvas, can you, glaze sort of in sections so that things don't dry too quickly or it doesn't get ahead of you? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and I use different mediums, which we talk about in the, okay. um, which mediums are best to use for um, a larger canvas like that. So this, here's the grisaille. So you can see that that gray was worked wet into a yellow underpainting. And you can be, and I, you can see that it's picking up lots of the tonal variations, and that yellow glow is already established. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the photo that they gave me of their puppy when they commissioned this, there was a slight, um, um, I can't, uh, where it's lit from behind. Yeah. Yeah. My the word just left me, um, and I wanted to really exaggerate that and punch it up. So here I'm starting to glaze over the trees in the background and the dog with some orange and next and the glow and um glazing a little bit on the water and more on the dog and next try not to take too long with these so over that orange i've in the trees i've placed some blue and i think the next one is the finished painting wow. so the backlighting that's the term yeah. <laughs> lots of backlighting i punched up um, you know, where our goal is always to improve on our photo reference. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, um, and I'll just say any questions or comments along the way, please just, just like I do when I'm teaching my groups or mentoring my groups, I should say, um, everyone just pitch in questions, comments anytime. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, um, I I think we could probably start the demo. How's our timing? Oh, we're only at 4.15, so yes, we've got lots okay, of Okay, that's great. Yeah. So the piece that I'm going to demo is actually a piece that one of my groups is currently working on, and um, some of them are, some of those people are here. I think everybody's <laughs> here. <laughs> so we decided that that would be a fun thing to do so that you can get a peek at what um, our master's group does. At, and so we're using, um, and in a sec, Vanessa will show you the pictures. It's uh, the group wanted to work on a horse. So this group we've been working together, oh, for a few months now. 
and um, it's been absolutely fabulous. And we're we've gotten well, both of my groups I work with, we've gotten really close knit, and um, so we've worked through a few different subject matters and and built up this learning about the techniques and so on. Ben had worked with me when he used to work at, live in Kamloops um, and wanted to come and join. So he's really progressing. And um, so now it was, you know, we all, I always see what do you want as a group to be learning and the group. Sorry. So is this group the one, are you having more people join this group? And if so, what happens to the people who are starting when you've been going already for a few months? That's How a great that question, Karen. That's a super question. And yes, both of my groups are, have room for more people, which is exciting. And um, we, uh, when someone new joins, we just catch them up and every time we start a new subject matter i go over all of the techniques and so on and the people who are already there find it really reinforcing and the new people are um are learning yeah. that's what I, I should maybe just um ex that that is a great question and i'll just take this opportunity to explain that masteries is set up a little bit differently in that there's no curriculum it's not like a class so mentorship is about working with the artist and so like Yvonne was explaining, whatever group kind of coalesces together to join at that time slot, it's very much like this where you, you know, everybody gets to see everybody and talk and chat and get to know one another. And then through that conversation and dialogue and community building, that's it's through that process that we learn. So not only from taking um, instruction and advice, uh, advice and guidance from Yvonne, and, and you know, seeing her demos, for example, if you know, if that's the way she's working, we also get to kind of shore each other up by, um, you know, assisting each other with just talking about whatever thing that our group needs at that moment, right? So it, it's very free flow. Um, you know, somebody might sometime bring up that they really want to know, like, how do I get into an art show or how do I sell my paintings or whatever? And, you know, we'll very much talk about that in class and, and pick Yvonne's brain about that or whoever your mentor is. So that that's the way Masterius is different. So that if you are, you know, people do flow in and out of groups. Um, a group can start, it launches as long as it has a num the right number of people, like minimum number of people to launch. And then if there's still spots open, like up to eight people, more people can join along the way, but you haven't really missed anything in that sense. You know what I mean? Because it, it's not like a class. And if you've missed the first three classes, you're going to fail the exam. It's not like that. It's, it's very much community and um, it has a different feel that way. So I'm actually glad you asked that question because Yvonne and I very much wanted this particular Meet the Mentor to not only be an opportunity to meet Yvonne, but to also let people that don't know anything about Mastrius or are curious about it to kind of understand how this platform works. So anyways, I'll stop talking. Go ahead, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Vanessa. So, um, so yes, the... This one of the groups we decided that we'll work on will that our, my demo will be and tonight would have been our next meeting actually so it works well so there um, we're going to demo from that so we'll show you Vanessa will show you the initial grisaille so this painting already has a layer on the subject matter but nothing on the background yet so it's part way along so this is the it started with a nickel as a yellow glaze and starting to work into that. Oh, and I want to also say that in the group, not everyone has to use my photo reference. So some people are using mine, someone, some are using their own um, photo reference of a horse. It was just a consensus that they would, that the group wanted to learn how to paint horses. Okay, one more question. I don't know how to draw a horse. Do you have a background sort of drawing under your painting as well? Is there? Oh, yes. Um, that's a great question too, Karen. So we go over techniques to help you to draw. Is that and this subject matter is quite difficult. So we go over um, techniques that will help you to draw that, such as gritting, those kinds of things. Yeah. 
And um, you, oh, thanks, Vanessa. She zoomed in so you can see the drawing. Can you see? Yeah, you, could you see that? Yes. Do you want? To, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I love, I love it. Those are such good questions. Sorry, um, um, sorry. They, my yeah. thing's gotten away from me here. Trying to advance the slide. I think I have to go out of this and because when I zoomed in, it didn't let me um, advance to the next slide. So let me just go back there. Sorry about that, everybody. No worries. It's all good. There we go. Okay. Hopefully this will work. Oh, it's not letting me go to the next slide, Yvonne. <laughs> <laughs> it, they were over on the side. Maybe you could go back to that and we'll click on them. I will. Okay. I'll just do it in this one. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. We'll just do it this way. You're seeing all the um the whole PowerPoint this way. <laughs> and this Everybody one. See that? So this is the completed <laughs> grizai. And uh, so we I demo all along the way. So we demoed how to draw the horse, then how to paint the horse, then how to do the background. The background is palette knife work, lots of palette knife work in the mane as well. So there's the completed grizai picking up the yellow um tonal value from the yellow blaze so it is not just a flat gray which really adds to the glow and then the next painting we've started to add um glazes to the horse and continuing on the next guy there we go and now the next one is the finished um not finished to where the painting is now that's where we're up to and that's where we've left off and um, I don't know if everyone in the group is like me. I'm so excited to keep going and add some more, a little bit more depth and contrast and color in the background. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So, uh, it's uh, 20 or 36 by 24 that I'm doing so easy, nice and big. And let's, so I'll bring him up closer and um, I'm going to be working on the background first, just to show what it's like to glaze over um, some uh, grisaille area. So this is up still in the grisaille gris area and you can see the tonal values that I wanted it nice and dark here, lighter as we go up a nice and really light and bright close to his dark mane. And then we'll go in and add a little bit of glazes to the deepest shadows um, as on the horse as well. And uh, so I'm going to start with a phthalo blue. And I want this background would be really the sky's the limit, your artistic license to what you would want that background to be. It could be greens. It could be monochromatic with the color of the horse. I'm going to try out some blues and see how that looks. And then, um, that, oh, well, I'll just start with that and then we'll talk about other colors. So actually, let's see. I think I'll keep him here and move you forward. Uh, so, let's see. I'll move you just a little bit. Up. I'll move him over, over closer to my eaves, so my uh, palette. And it's going to have to go up a bit more. Yeah, that should be good if you're starting in the lower corner. Yeah. Yeah, there. So this one is in oils. And um, as I was saying, we do some of the demos I do in acrylics and some in oils. So I'm going to use a uh, Neo McGilp medium by uh, Gamblin. And the other medium of choice I love is Liquid um, by Winsor & Newton. Uh, and if you're working in acrylics, 
you use the medium of your choice for this. So we're going to mix up a glaze. And if you want to come over to my palette, okay. and I'm going to put gloves on since I'm working in oils so that I don't get, I'm a bit of a messy painter. So it's best if I wear gloves and you really don't want to get oil paint um, into your, if you have any nicks or cuts in your skin, you really don't want that. Or if you're going to take off your gloves and have a snack at some point, definitely don't want any paint near your food. So it's kind of handy to wear gloves. And to mix a glaze, I'm using a transparent pigment. So this is uh, phthalo blue. And I'll add about half medium, approximately half. With phthalo blue is such a strong pigment, I can add even more than half medium. I can. Is it the some. same combination when you're using acrylic? I was just going to say, and now if you're using acrylic, um, uh, you would want to do the same ratio, but you can add um, up to an eighth of a uh, retardant medium. So that looks like, so whichever medium you love to use for your um, acrylics, and we've talked about that in both of our groups, but then we also, whoops, we're over here. Oh, also, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a retarder medium. And um, you can add up to about an eighth of that safely to your acrylic paints, and it just slows it down so that you can work with that glaze really well, really nicely. Now, I can tell on my palette that that's pretty strong. I'm going to put in it even more medium, such a strong pigment. So again, this is a transparent pigment and adding the glaze makes it like stained glass window. It's transparent, the light shines right through, bounces the color back to your eye. Okay, so let's use a big brush. And back to the easel and I can even dip the brush into some of the medium too. Oh no, that's good. So usually there's lots of interaction with our group members. <laughs> do you rub some of it off or do you just let it stay as it is? That's another great question, Karen. This one, I'm going to keep it as it is for most of the um, area. Now, this is one layer I'm going to, when this is dry, and the reason I want it to be dry um, is I like the effect that I can get and the glow that I can get by letting this dry and then glazing yet another color. So it's this is very brilliant right now. Um, and then I'll glaze some purple down in the deepest area areas later and some purple into the horse, some dioxazine purple, which is a beautiful single pigment purple. And that will add harmony as well, which the, the underpainting, having the Nicolazzo yellow glaze over the whole painting first also adds harmony, adds a lot to the harmony of the piece. Now I'll probably use a smaller brush to get up really close to his face to make sure I don't get this blue on his face. And then as I go up further, I have options. I can, I'm going to put a bit more medium on my palette just to be able to, and mix that in. I can, I want this to be lighter. Oh, I'll move my easel down. Yep. So I want it to, it, 
to be lighter at the top, it will automatically be lighter because of the tonal values underneath. So I think you can see that. And as we get up into the lighter, lighter and lighter. So I can go ahead and glaze all of it. And then I could work some white into the glaze to um, get some nice bright light blues up here. Or I could mix a veil now, which would mean I could add some white to this glaze. So is glaze something that you can stop with and then go back to without worrying about having marks sort of to carry on? Yes, you would. When I do that, I do that a lot because, especially when I work on huge paintings, I might not get to the whole thing. Um, so I would just kind of feather it so that there's no solid line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really important to be able to do that. Now, I'm going to hold it closer to you just so that you can see that the... The yellow bits underneath are just adding. Mm -hmm. They're looking green right now. And they add some interest. And again, they'll just keep changing as we add more color. It's like a nice abstract kind of bouquet effect, you know, like out of focus in the background almost. Yes, that's right. I, in the end, my goal with this background is to be atmospheric right yes not um yes yeah, so that the this fabulous creature is of course the focal point and then this background to be just really a bit dreamy i love um i love doing a dreamy background okay so i'll bring him down even more for you so your grise must be quite um, detailed then. It is, you're right, yes. So the beauty is if you do a detailed grisaille, that's where um, a lot of your work has, it's already been done. And yeah. then, yeah. And when we were with our group, when we, I demoed glazing the color over this horse and the people in the group, the comments were really fun. I don't know if anybody wants to um, wants to say anything about it, but what people were talking about how magical it is every time. So we've, they've done a few paintings with this technique. And again, it's like, wow, you just glaze over that grisaille. And, and it's, it's a little bit magical. How many I people? agree. I agree. I'm in one of Yvonne's groups and watching it, it's magical and it just comes to life. Like you just sit there with your mouth going, um, wow. <laughs> like you didn't really see it happening um, until that single layer of uh, single pigment glaze comes on top and then all of a sudden the horse just created depth uh, just by using the grisaille and then doing a glaze over top. Yes. This is true, yeah. I had the same feeling um, because I'd always known about artists using underpaintings and you know doing a little bit of research and you would just see photographs of different maybe stages of kind of that monochromatic um, underpainting and I would I would in the past always feeling like oh I just want to get onto the painting and I don't know like that looks boring and I that takes too much time and blah 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 but then when you actually get to see the results and see those steps in between like that magic that you were saying happens like and each each layer you do brings another kind of um, aspect of either depth or luminosity or whatever and now I don't I don't begrudge at all the time that I take to do an underpainting either as you know with grisaille or you know using some of David's techniques or whatever but to, to take that time um, in those first stages and that's when you can do a lot of correcting too right before you kind of get too far on, on in the painting 
you can also, you know, do a little bit more to back up a little bit and, and fix a few things before you're as committed to where you might be. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. It is amazing. It's uh, so I'm getting some white now and whether I'm using oils or acrylics, I would just put a little drop of medium with the white. And because I'm just going to work it in. Oh, thank you, Vanessa. So, um, and is this titanium for maximum? This is, ti yes, titanium white, rapid dry, mm -hmm. fast dry formula. And um, I always use that, especially for the underpaintings, but I really like the fast dry white because white dries so slowly. So I haven't finished the glazing. I just thought I'll go on to this part to show you. Now, again, there's so many options. Um, let's, so back at the easel, Let's see. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple of different options. What's that? So one would be that knife is kind of small. Let's get a larger knife. And this is just pure paint with no medium. No, this uh, I'm using the white. Whether I'm using acrylics or oils, I mixed. I would mix just a drop of medium in. Okay. So the medium makes um, a nice consistency to work with. It helps the drying process. I, I like using medium with my paints. So a couple of different options. One is to load a palette knife and work into that. And now there's a lot of texture because the background was done with palette knife initially in the grisaille stage there's lots of texture so the knife would pick that up another option is to with let's see let's use uh, this brush with a brush to go in with the white Now, using a brush, you're gonna pick up a lot more of the blue. Because your blue is still wet, yeah. Yes, yeah, you got it, exactly. I'm working wet into wet. When you did your grisaille, is your black a true black or did you make your own black? Oh, it's a true single pigment black. So okay. I use Mars black. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to use a uh, single pigment black, like the old masters did. They used single pigment, um, and but you can add white or black to a single pigment, and it um, retains the glow. So I. As I say, I kind of like putting the glaze on and then working into it. And you're starting to see now that background turn a little bit more atmospheric already. And the yellow kind of goes back to yellow when I do this underneath, not the bright yellow, but. And then deciding, you know, with your artistic license, how far down you want to go with that. And um, Karen mentioned earlier, do you ever just wipe it off? Absolutely. Sometimes there's a spot in a painting where I want to glaze, wipe it off, and leave just the amount behind. That um, the amount that stays behind is just right. 
And do you need a damp cloth to do that with? Or? Um, so that I would do depending on the effect I want. So you can either use a dry, these, the blue shop towels yep. have less, right, less lint in them. So they're great to use. Um, if you wanted to remove a lot, you could, with um, acrylics, you could, well, with either actually dip the cloth into the medium. But yeah. if you just, um, usually, if you've got the glaze on, you only want to remove a little bit. So you would use dry. Yeah, okay. So just a dry, right, yeah. And that brings back some of the, some of the yellow can glow through then, but the blue is, and what happens is the, the glaze stays in the valleys and as you wipe, it comes off from the peaks, if that makes sense. Now I have it, oh, I'm getting, faking his ear blue. So if you do that, then you want a little bit of, cloth. I'm twisting around. I wasn't watching what I was doing properly, twisting around to see, make sure that I'm not standing in front of the camera. And and I haven't gone in here with all the... Did you say you put a little bit of medium on the cloth to get the blue off the ear? You got it. Yeah. Okay. A little bit of medium in the oils or in acrylics. So this technique of leaving some of the glaze in the valleys and taking it off the peaks is how Rembrandt made those fabulous, um, realistic looking beards. So, and he would use a black glaze. Um, and so he would create lots of texture on the, his underpainting um, at, for the beard. And then later on, it's all nice and dry and glaze over that with black and rub it off with amazing effect. Mm -hmm. Well, so how yeah. long does it take in the oil for it to dry before you can go to the next step? Um, uh, well, the, this will dry in a few days. Um, I like to leave a week just so that I'm, I'm sure it's really nice and dry, but um, four or five days for sure. Acrylics, of course, you can keep going within minutes, um, which is a big advantage. And both oils and acrylics have their own advantages. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what's really nice is having a few paintings on the go at a time. And I find it's really good for my paintings as well. If I work on this and then while this layer is drying, I go over here and work on, um, you know, a, a peony. And then those two are both drying. And I'm over here working on a, on a figure, figure of piece. Um, and by the time I get back, I rotate through a few paintings and by the time I get back, um, this might, you know, when you're not thinking about a painting, your brain still works on it and um, problem solves and so on. So I love it when that happens. Totally. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's keep going with some of the glaze over here. So when you uh, were painting the the mane of the horse that's flying up there in the in the wind, yes. <laughs> um, were you specific, just just doing like negative painting, or did you also do a lot of texture so that you can do that sort of wiping off, like you were talking about with the beard, with yes. that, with the mane as well? Yes, lots of texture. So let's see if you can okay. see. Oh yeah. Oh good, yeah, we couldn't see that. Yeah, um, palette knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially in um, the areas that are highlights mm -hmm. on that mean. So uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. I just remembered another part I want to do. So let's just, without working white into this one, let's do a little bit of this. Just um, I always love to give people options. I'm going to come up close to the main. And then I also, another, I still, still think of David when I finger blend. So that's another 
thing you can do is uh, um, to move the glaze around and not take very much off is to use your hand with oils or with acrylics. And it has a different effect than the ray. And this way you can see the different effect of glazing and wiping from glazing and adding white and then wiping. So it's a little bit, of course, a little bit different. Whenever you add start, uh, whenever you add white, it starts to move toward cooler. So this is cooler than this. And it's okay if I get a little bit of blue on the main, because I actually want to add some blue in some of these highlights that the light can reflect into. Nice. I love the way the blue is contrasting with the horse. With the browns. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of love that too. Now again, artistic license. You can keep going the way I would I would definitely keep going with the blues. And then I can go back in with more whites. Depending on, you know, and not I always say a good painting takes a lot of looking. So standing back looking. Um, how are you liking this? Now, if I'm going to keep that, I would want it to come over and not be too separate from what's happening over here. So I would probably even take some of this back. Again, dip into a bit of medium. If I'm keeping this warmer, I want some of that over there too. So I would keep going here, but you get the idea. So let's come down and work on the horse a little bit. Unless there are any questions and comments so far. Oh, I should mention, um, I would need to get a, a finer brush and go between mm -hmm. in the negative spaces between the name. And I could do that now and be, or I can do that after I've done the main. I just don't want to pick up each other. So I, I'll work on the main to show you some of that. Now, let's see, that's just for fun. I'm going to bring him, I think he needs to come closer to you. There we go. And let's just see what this blue looks like reflecting into these highlights. Um, I think it should be a tone. So we've used a glaze, we used a bit of a veil. Well, we worked white into the glaze. Now a tone will have a bit of black and a bit of white. So it will be more gray. So I'll go back to my palette and my white has blue in it now from dipping my brush um, to get the white on and it picks up the glaze and then I dip back and uh, ends up messing up the white, which is fine because I want to bring some blue into that. And where are we going? Oh, on the highlights, right? Okay. So that, that's a tint, adding just white. And now let's bring in a little black. So it tones that blue down a little bit. A bit more of the glaze. Okay. Still lots of medium. This is actually a veil now because it has some opaqueness to it. The glaze is transparent like a stained glass window, and the veil is um, translucent. It has the. Uh, I'm just not sure if that's too bright. It always looks a little bit different on your palette for, than on the canvas. So you kind of have to test it out a little bit. I'm adding more blue and more black. It's just looking right there. Right there, that's looking better. There we go. It's called a shade now because you added black. This is now a 
tone. If I just had, great question, Vanessa, if I just added black to the blue, that's a shade. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, black and white is a tone. Um, and I, mean, I wanna do a clean brush. So of course with acrylics, I would mix exactly the same and then just wash my brush out. But I'm doing, this is oil, so I'm not, the brush that I used, let's see, let's try this one. It had some of the tint. It'll be okay. So hopefully there's enough medium in this. I don't want it to be. So back to my, back to the easel. That's pretty bright still. Oh yeah. So if I hold my brush parallel, to the canvas, it'll pick up some of that texture. And then if it's too bright. Hmm. I'll just do a little bit of it and then I want to mix up some dioxazine purple. Now I would use a little bit of that glaze and just touch it in a couple of places on his face, on this side of his face as well. Nice. Just so that there's some harmony, just very slightly in the shadow probably. Um, but I'll go back and mix up a purple glaze. So this is dioxazine purple back at my palette. And it's another really strong pigment. It almost, it actually, it almost looks black on the camera, I think. So yeah. some clean medium. There we go. I cleaned my palette knife off really well too. And I'm mixing them. It's maybe 60 to 70 medium. 30 to 40 pigment, and I would do the same with a color and the clean brush. Let's go. Back to the easel and let's deepen up some of this. Dog's design purple is quite lovely in shadows. Now I don't know if it camera's picking it up and I'm going to overlap right on. Because I want to add some depth and more contrast. It can go over some of those highlights as well. So it doesn't necessarily look very purpley to the eye over the browns and reds. It definitely deepened it though. Doesn't it deepen it? Mm -hmm. Purple is amazing for that. It's extending back. You can have a little bit of that on his mane here too, just to deepen. Kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little bit in his ear, deepen that contrast here. Yvonne, will you just 
add the purple to the brown or will you start adding any umbers in with that brown or within with the purple as well? Oh, that's a great question, Suzanne. I'll, I'd like to um, punch up some of the reddish tones with um, in acrylics, I would use quinacridone nicolazo gold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the oils, probably quinacridone orange. Some companies call it quinacridone rust. It's a really rusty, reddy, orange kind of color. But we have um, lots of browns and reds, or browns established in some reds. And I really like the way that the purple deepens it. And depending on the piece, you know, some of the, my horse paintings, I purple absolutely would not have been a choice. I would have done um, umber. Now this needs some up here too. As he's, his hair is flying back into shadow back here. And uh, I might up here where the light is shining through, I'd probably do some of those colors we just talked about, the quinacridone, quinacridone um, Nicolazzo gold or the quinacridone orange. So lots more contrast being added. And once I have the deeps, I, I'll go back and see what I want to do with these highlights. Maybe some of them, will, the, once the blue is dry, will be glazed over with purple in some of them. So I'm just going to the deepest parts then. And down here, uh, I'll bring him up for you. Let's see. Nice. A little bit of this purple glaze can deepen. Now this is quite thin, this glaze now. And I'm not, I don't have very much on my brush. I just want a little bit of it to deepen the contrast where the shadows are the st most strong. Good in his nostril. I hope this is a painting that will end up on your website so we can see it when it's done. Ah, yeah, good idea. I need to update that, my photos on my website. So yes, I'll make sure I get this one on when it's all finished. And I'll post it in, uh, well, for the group that's working on this course, of course. Mm. But I can post it on the master's page too, on our feed. Yeah, so if you um, decide to be mentored and join a master's group, all these, um, you have the recording that you get to work along with later and all of the photos and so on get uploaded for you to be, um, to make use of in your own work as well. Yeah, they're very helpful resources, that's for sure. Mm. Okay. Yvonne, does this technique work for, um, it works for all different kinds of styles of painting, right? Like, 
Yes. Because you, you do you do your dreamscapes as well. Did you do your you've done you your dreamscapes in this technique, right? Yes, you're right. Okay. This technique, yes, it's fabulous, really for whatever Donya you're wanting to paint. I'm looking in now that I'm looking at the camera, I think, whoa, that blue is looking really bright on the camera. Oh, I like it. <laughs> um, and it can, yeah, it's um will will help when it's dry, some purples. And another option would be to um, do a tone or a shade. So adding white and black or just black to deepen down here as well. Um, so yes, all the subject matter, it's incredible for figures. And of course, figures are a little bit like horses. If I move him back, you'll be able to get a bigger, better picture. Um, so um, yes, still life. Oh, landscapes, it's amazing. It's, yeah, all the different subject matter. There really isn't a subject matter that it doesn't work for. And yeah, the camera's not picking up everything, but probably give, hopefully you can get an idea. And um, how's our time? How are... We just hit five o'clock. <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. That flew by. <laughs> <laughs> that did, I was sure we had lots of time. <laughs> So then I will move him back if we're finished our hour. My goodness, it did fly back by. It's beautiful, Yvonne. Yeah, it is. Well, I'm hoping that it will be beautiful in the end. And like I always say to people who are learning with me, if it is not yet beautiful, it is not yet the end. <laughs> <laughs> so true. There we go. It's coming. Yeah. So Jan and Ben and Suzanne, you guys are going to work on your horse and mm -hmm. I'll be adding all kinds of notes and photos about this process for you. And we'll talk about it more. And I'm going to go back where I can see all of your lovely. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll remove the spot right. and then you'll be able to, oops, there we go. Right. There we go. Yeah, and just since it's the meet the mentor and we're talking about um, Yvonne today, like one thing that that I've noticed um, comparing her, um, you know, classroom technique to others is that she she really goes above and beyond providing resources to us between um, between sessions between these live sessions. She she's very interactive with the group in our chat. And she provides lots of um, helpful tips and, and, you know, answering any questions that we have and lots of photos and explanation, like way above and beyond a lot of other, you know, uh, mentors that I've, that I've worked with. So that's a bonus if you take a class with Yvonne as well. Most definitely. Does anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up or? Thank you guys. That was very kind of everything that everybody said. No, oh, that was great. Yeah. Thank you. I always have lots of questions. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's, That's fun. Great. I, care. I love that. And Deb, <laughs> I haven't met you. De Deb, let me know. There we you. go. Now I have my unmute. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you a navigator as well? I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, um, I was lucky enough to work with David Langevin as well. So I have a, uh, a good idea of where you're going on this. Yeah. Oh, very <laughs> fun. Yeah. Yeah, lucky you. I've always used glazes, but um, I haven't always used them the same way. So it's interesting to learn the different ways that you can use glazes. Oh, yeah. so many ways, right? Yes, totally. Yes, for example, David is no longer using the grisaille, but he he'll do an underpainting, he'll do a glaze and then add, yeah, it's, so he glazes to, and adds color and contrast and depth. And both of us use both transparents and opaques. And that seems to be really important, um, at least in my mind, for a successful painting. So people, when people hear layering technique, they think, oh, you're only using transparents. But no, transparent pigments and opaques mm -hmm. to create 
um, you know, a successful, beautiful painting. Which you must you... have to have a really good um, idea of colors and how they mix together. Do you make a lot of little things to test them out and see what glaze yes. does what? <laughs> and we've done some of that in the groups as well. And Do does we... it matter what layer it's on for what you get or is it? <laughs> it, it does to a point, yeah. And the science is that even applying, like the, it might be slightly different each time and for each artist and applying um, the way that your brush stroke and so on puts the different layers down. So then when the light comes through, it bounces off those different layers and bounces back to the viewer's eye. So yeah. sometimes it's so much fun and so magical that, you know, suddenly you'll see, oh, there's purple in that sky and I didn't use purple. Um, and people who are learning with me will often say, oh my goodness, where did that pink come from? And it's just the, right, the yeah. way that the light's bouncing around between the layers. So Which you um, create more colors than you even used. Which do you prefer, oil or acrylic? I prefer oils, but um, acrylics have, so, uh, of course, so many advantages too. So <laughs> yeah, I, I do, I really like both. And the more I work with acrylic, so I used to work primarily in oils, now I do both. Well, more oils than acrylic, but the more I work in acrylics, the more I'm really loving the things about them that are advantageous. Yeah, <laughs> they're, mm, good question. <laughs> well thanks everybody for coming thank you so much that was great yeah thank you thank, thank you. you thank you thank very you. much and the people in the group that's in my groups it's so supportive of you that means it means a ton <laughs> bring on fans <laughs> oh. Yeah, and anybody who's watching this either now or in a uh, watching the recording later, and you, you know, there's lots of information on the Mastrius website as well about how this all works. And there's people there to help you if you have questions, you can't find what you're looking for. Um, but I really encourage, you know, to at least try it out once. If you're an artist, it's um, it's a really great way to connect with other artists and to learn a ton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. Yvonne. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet you. Bye. Thank everybody. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.